provide you with information you may have never heard before. On today's show, my guest is L.A. Marzuli, who is the author of the Nephilim trilogy, which continues to thrill readers a decade after the first book in the series was published. Marzuli is also the author of the non-fiction work Politics, Prophecy and the Supernatural. The book packs a hard-hitting exposure of how the current political landscape may bring about ancient biblical prophecies, which then may trigger supernatural events that are foretold in the book of Daniel and Revelation. Marzuli has lectured on his exhaustive research at conferences and churches, as well as made appearances and interviews on numerous national and international radio and TV programs. L.A. Marzuli, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's great to have you on. And uh, just for the audience, just tell us uh, briefly a little bit about yourself as well. Um, I've been a researcher, author. I've written nine books. We produced um, eight videos called The Watcher Series. Uh, I've been born again, spirit-filled Christian for 34 years. And uh, that's been quite a ride <laughs> and, uh, and continues to, into the present. Uh, my latest book is called On the Trail of a Nephilim. Uh, I go to places, for instance, in Peru, Bolivia, all over the United States, Mexico, and uh, we're starting to get over into Europe because some of these ancient megalithic sites and ancient sites that we see um, all over the globe tie into my work. And I'm not an archaeologist, but I work with archaeologists or anthropologists or any other expert that I might need to, to, um, to bring on board, so to speak, to, to look at artifacts like, uh, I'll show you one real quick, like this. Wow. Yeah. The elongated skull. Yes. Okay. Well, we're going to get into that as well, I mean, because that's, that's a key part um, of your work as well. Um, but just to begin with, uh, just for the audience who may not know too much about the Nephilim, just explain how you, you know, got into this and their connection to, to mankind, basically. Well, the Nephilim are basically, we actually hear about them first in the Genesis 6 narrative, which is found in the, in the Judeo-Christian Bible. Specifically, that would be Genesis, so it's in the Torah. It's Thank thousands you. of years old. really great to be here. Thanks and there's so also other books which relate the same incident that we do see in Genesis. And specifically, um, the book of Enoch tells us that, and, and, and sort of um, amplifies the Genesis 6 account. The Genesis 6 account tells us that the sons of God saw the daughters of men and desired them, found out that they were beautiful, and took wives from whomever they wished, just chose wives, okay? And they married them. And the progeny of the sons of God and the women of earth became this entity known as the Nephilim. Here's the rub, and this is, this is what it all boils down to. Who are the sons of God? And when we read the book of Enoch or the Enochian account, we discover that Enoch makes it very clear who the sons of God. The angels of heaven is what he says. The first thing we need to do for your audience is, is sort of diffuse in their mind what they think angels are. They're not these little cherubic beings with harps and stuff floating on clouds. It's not what we're looking at. These are powerful powerful, intelligent entities that, quite frankly, have the ability to manipulate space, time, and matter in ways that we've never seen before. In other words, we would call that supernatural um, manifestations if, if we had an, what I would consider an angelic encounter. It's not what most people think. In fact, when we go back and examine angelic encounters in the biblical narrative, what we find is that most people do a face plant. An angel appears, and people just go, whoa, boom, right on the ground. Yeah. So this, this is what we're looking at. These are powerful, intelligent beings. But here's the rub. There's two sets. One are the good guys, and the other one are the bad guys, the fallen hosts of heaven. And that's what the book of Enoch sort of amplifies that Genesis 6 passage and opens it up to the reader. And tells us that these fallen angels came down in the days of Jared thousands of years ago on a place called Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is, exists today, and it basically borders Lebanon, Syria, and Israel. It's a hot zone. It's also a, um, a UN um, um, sacred site, for lack of a better term. So that's a little bit about the Nephilim. What they did 
when they were here for about 450 years, they were, and the reason why they came, and I wrote about this extensively in my book, The Cosmic Chess Match. What's going on here uh, is a pollution of the human genome. Because earlier in, in, the, in the Genesis narrative, specifically Genesis 3, we read this bizarre um, piece of scripture. And it says this, there are four people present. There's the Most High God, there's the fallen angel or the fallen cherub known as Satan, and there's Adam and Eve. And that's what the story, those are the characters in the story. Whether you believe that or not is irrelevant. I believe it literally. So there's four, there's four beings that are there in this setting. And the Most High God goes to Satan, your seed, Satan, will be at enmity with the seed of the woman. This sets up, in my opinion, the rest of the biblical narrative. What's happening is a seed war. The fallen angel has seed. And that seed is going to be at enmity with the seed of the woman. Skip over to Genesis 6, and that's exactly what we see. We see a seed war going on. The fallen angelic coast come down on Mount Hermon. They take wives from whomever they wish. They go into them, strictly in the biblical sense. And the, the progeny of this unholy union is called the Nephilim, or the Nephilim, which then results in the flood of Noah. Now, that's really heavy stuff, and a lot of people have a lot of trouble with that. That's the narrative. That's what it says. I'm not the first person who's promulgated this, but we are, just so you get sort of an overview, yeah. we are in a, a cosmic war, which has been going on literally for millennia, and is now manifesting on this planet in ways that I've never seen. It's ongoing, and it's reaching. It's coming up. It's reaching a pinnacle. And I think we're getting close to that, okay. to seeing that pinnacle being reached. Uh, absolutely, and and I suppose this is you know leads into your work, the sort of you know the the key work that you do, which is the end time prophecy as well. Sure, that it, it definitely dovetails into that. Um, and and there's a there's a bit of a bridge, or you know I've got I just can't jump over into from a nephilim into end time prophecies. But I will say this: the bridge for this is. The words of Yeshua, the words of Jesus 2,000 years ago. Remember, when he utters this, there is no Christian church. There's no pope or vicars or stained glass windows or churches all over England or America. There's none of that. There's no Martin Luther Reformation. There's no confessionals, monks with funny haircuts, rosaries. There's no crusades. There's no nonsense that man has, has attached to what really happened. The whole idea of his coming was to set the captives free. That's you and me. That's why he came for. And when we believe on him who was sent, Yeshua, and we say, okay, I've done a lot of weird stuff in my life called sin. I'm sorry for that. I believe that your blood atones for my sin. And by believing in you, I can become born again and spirit-filled. Spirit-filled is when the spirit of a living God comes in and dwells in a person. That happened to me 34 years ago, and it's ongoing. It never goes away. Uh, of course, unless we want it to go away, we can walk away from it on some level. What I mean by that is we can choose not to listen to his voice anymore and do our own will. But that's another topic for another time, perhaps. So the bottom line is, is that we are in this, this cosmic war. And Yeshua, Jesus, tells us something 2,000 years ago. And when he says this, there is no Bible. There's the, there's the Torah and the, and, and the Tanakh, the Old Testament, but there is no New Testament. Again, there is no church. And he says, and this is what's remarkable, when I return, it'll be like the days of Noah. Yeah, That's I, a loaded, pregnant statement. Yeah, Loaded I, with meaning, and it forces, it forces the, the person, the student of biblical prophecy to immediately go back to the days of Noah and read the account in Genesis 6 and other places and, and find out what differentiates those days. And guess what? It's the fallen angels coming back down to earth and cohabiting with the daughters of men. Interestingly enough, in the Genesis 6 account, it tells us um, that the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards, and that's where we get into stuff like this. And that's where my research comes in. Right, okay. Before we get into the uh, elongated skull and everything else, let's just also um, 
look into your work into giants as well because um you know these these uh, uh, these beings i mean they they were huge weren't they well in the first incursion in the days of noah um they they were very large um perhaps 20 25 feet some some biblical scholars even even placed them larger than that and that's unbelievable after the flood something happens to our dna um we're not living 500 to 900 years anymore. Um, our days on earth are about 120 years. So something changes in our DNA, and that's also in the Genesis account. Um, Chuck Missler stated that, that they're not getting what they used to get, they being the fallen angelic host. When, they, when they're cohabiting with, with, with women and trying to create a hybrid, they're not getting what they used to get. We know that Og, uh, the, the king of Bashan, and, and Bashan is, is, is now what would be the Golan Heights in Syria, okay, or the Golan Heights that Israel controls now. That's all the area of Bashan uh, in, in modernity, in modern times. And what's interesting about that, uh, Kevin, is that Og's bed stand was probably 14 to 15 feet. It was made out of iron, so it was very heavy because he was a pretty big guy. He might have been 13, 14 foot tall. Goliath who comes later after Og, might have been between 9 and 12 feet tall. So we see that, yes, there is giantism, certainly by anything in our standards, um, but it begs the question, well, why aren't they 20 feet? And this is because our DNA is changing. So as our DNA is changing after the flood, um, we're not getting 20 footers anymore. We're getting 12 to 14 footers. Interestingly enough, in, the, in some of the... Um, archaeological narratives from the 20th, the 19th and the 20th century, well over 120 years ago, we read accounts and stories of 12-footers being found. Um, I was on, uh, and I heard about this through uh, a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, Jim Watson, who wrote a book called Mysterious Catalina. Now, I had heard about the giants in America, and I was trying to track some of this down and seeing if there was any photographic evidence. We know that a lot of um, uh, reports came out again at the, at the turn of the 19th into the 20th century. There were all these reports in newspapers where people were going into these mounds and finding these very large skeletons. And of course, when you talk about this today, uh, archaeologists will immediately propose that all, this, all of this was disproven. Well, all of this wasn't disproven, in my opinion. Um, it was basically swept under the rug. And the reason why it was swept under the rug is because there, at this time, the Darwinian paradigm was already in place. The Darwinian paradigm is sacrosanct both in academia and in the scientific community. If you don't take my word for this, watch a movie by, by, by Ben Stein called Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed. Um, and you will see that tenured professors have lost their jobs in universities for even mentioning the idea of intelligent design. So to get back on track here, my friend Jim Watson, I had a meeting with him, and Watson said, you know, they just discovered this cache of photographs and journals and records from this archaeologist in 1919 who was, who was employed by the High Museum. The High was later gobbled up by the Smithsonian, but uh, this, by, this man, his name was Ralph Glidden, and he was uh, employed by the High Museum, and he was doing primitive archaeological digs in Catalina. And in other Channel Islands. The Channel Islands are off the, off the coast of California from Santa Barbara up here down to uh, San Diego. It's this chain of islands which just kind of dot, dot along the coast. Catalina is about 26, 27 miles from Los Angeles. So I hopped on a plane uh, after about six to eight months of negotiating uh, with, the, with the museum there. I gave them a thousand dollar donation which I was more than happy to do because they're looking to build a new museum, and I certainly support that cause. And they allowed me to go into the back room where the public doesn't get to go, and I got to look at all the um, records and, that were kept in boxes. Let me see if I have a shot of this. I just want to show you just basically um, what I looked at when I got to Catalina. Sure. This is, this is an example of the typical museum box where everything is kept right there. You can see that. Incredible, incredible. So I was able to, the first thing I did, and there were, two, there were two tables with white paper on them. I set up my camera on a tripod, lighting, everything was set up, and, and, and let the fun begin. And you can see that this, this was a catalog site. Everything had been, been picked over by anthropologists, by archaeologists. You can see here, everything is completely, um, you know, cataloged. And here we see Ralph Glidden photos, Santa Catalina Island. 
And that was one of the first files I actually took um, out of the box. And this is what I discovered. This is my intellectual property. And I say that because um, I was just on a show here in the States on the History Channel called In Search of the Lost Giants. That's right. By the Vieira brothers. And it made the Vieira, it made the Vieira brothers look like they discovered it. Well, the way that came down, and look, Jim and his brother are great guys, and I like them and everything, but... You know, they, they don't have any control of what happens in the editing room, but that's my intellectual property. I actually gave that photograph to the Vieiras months before the show ever aired, and I had no idea that they were in, in, in talks for a production deal for their own show. Never would have given them that. Anyway, all was well and good, and uh, uh, we, we mended fences, and they had me on the show, and I got to talk about Benefilim, and I showed them this photograph very similar to what I'm about to do now on Skype. And, and here, we, here we go. Uh, this is Ralph Glidden standing. I'm trying to get it level here. This is Ralph Glidden standing in a recently excavated pit. And you will notice right below him is yeah. a very large skeleton in situ. Right here. Very large skeleton in situ. It is not a disarticulated bone pile. Ralph Glidden is 5 foot 8 inches tall. OK, so I, I went to my blog and I posted I'm looking for people that can take photographs and based on the photograph. Um, and if we have a measurement of someone standing there can extrapolate different heights. I had four people that that uh, contacted me out of the four, three finished. So we had with, with the study of the photograph, we had a triple blind study going with three different computer programs. So the, I'm going to show you this. This man took the photograph. Yep. And stood Ralph Gooden straight up. So we know he's five foot eight. Then he took the giant or the skeleton in front of Gooden and he stood this up. And at this point, we realize um, that this is very, very large. And this is what we've got. Now, what are, what's the explanation from mainstream science for, for that uh, size of skeleton then? Well, what they're trying to tell us is that Glidden staged the photograph. How convenient is that? Now, if Glidden staged the photograph, this is a straw man argument. If Glidden staged the photograph, why didn't he ever use it in his museum? Why didn't he ever take, take the photograph and say, look, a giant? Well, he never did that. He talked about giants, but he never used the photograph that I'm aware of in any of his displays or anything else. And in fact, no one until my research took this photograph and had analyzed and had it analyzed. No one has done that. I'm the first person to do that. And three people, all three people, that's a triple blind study. There's no collusion between any of them. And it's all in this book. And it's all documented. And all three of them put the skeleton at just over nine feet. So we rounded it down to eight foot six for any type of error. We were conservative. I could have been sensation, you know, sen uh, sensationalistic and go, oh, we've got a nine foot six skeleton. Some and the researchers put it over nine feet, but I dumbed it down to eight and a half feet because I wanted to be conservative with the view. The bottom line is no one has rebutted this evidence yet. Um, and interestingly enough, we found another skeleton there, and I want to show you this real quick, which we found which was just incredible. Um, and this skeleton um, had six fingers. And the reason why this is so important to our research is because, um, let me see if I can find this guy, is because the Native American tradition talks about large skeletons with six fingers. And so if it's interesting how the Native Americans um, talk about this incessantly and, and tell us, look, this is what this is what was here. This is what this is what our tribe um, found. And we had to sort of war against these these tribes of of, of giants. And I'm having trouble. Look, here it is. And, and this again, this photograph sat in a collection and no one commented on it. No one saw it till. I came along, and the only reason why I saw it is because I'm looking for it. How many fingers do you see? Look right here. Look right here. Oh, yes, that's right. Yes, yes, yes. One, two, three, four, five, and the thumb is behind the bone. The thumb, 
The thumb is behind the bone, like right here. Yep. That's a six finger giant. That skeleton was measured. Uh, we were able to do the same type of, of um, measurement with it. And we basically have a nine footer here. Incredible. And has Based that on the size of the bull. Absolutely. And, and uh, has that had any sort of uh, analysis done on it? It's DNA or anything like that? No. Oh, because, and here, here's the problem, Kevin. No one knows what happened to any of these skeletons. No, they, they have vanished. Isn't that convenient? We have photographic proof that these existed. And yet, somehow, the skeletons have just vanished. So we can't do any DNA testing. This is why we're... I want to show you one more, one more sure. photograph. This was taken from Ralph Glidden. Once again, um, mother and child in a grave. And I want you to look at something. What do you notice right off the bat? Well, the heads the, for the one skull, thing. Yeah. The, the skull is very large and elongated. And look at the child's skull. Very large and elongated. And this is, once again, this ties into our work in Peru. And I want to show you something. This, this skull here came from, this is what we found in a place called Watara in Peru. Incredible. And so we're separated by thousands of miles and who knows how many years. And yet we see a similarity between what we see in Peru and what we have out on Catalina. And you know, all I can tell you is that, in my opinion, there's an outside agency that's manipulating the human genome. And guess what? We see evidence of this all over the planet. And I want to talk about the skulls in Peru. Yes, please. Real, real quick. This is, this is a very large skull. Uh, the, the cranial capacity of this particular skull has 30% more um, space than a normal human being. 30% um, more, look at the size of this. It's not a giant, but it's very elongated. And what we discovered, um, there's a, there's, you know, there are people that are trying to tell us, um, and, and it's funny how they do this, that all, all these skulls um, were elongated artificially. And what I mean by that, they place a board on the head here and a board on the back of the head and then bind the head, and that creates the shape. That's what they say. Well, this debate was raging in 1842 when, excuse me, when archaeologists were down in Peru. And this is what, this is what these archaeologists say. And um, I'm going to show you a lithograph of this. Oops, sorry. Yeah, there it is. This is a lithograph from 1842. And I'll, let me read it first, and then I'll show you the picture. We ourselves have observed the same fact in many mummies of children of tender age who, although they had cloths about them, that's, you know, they're, they're bound like mummies, were yet without any vestige or appearance or pressure of the cranium. In other words, they found skulls that were wrapped with you know, mummy wrappings, but there was no cradle headboarding. There was no elongated skull. Um, more still, the same formation of the head presents itself in children yet unborn. And in this truth, we have had convincing proof in the sight of a fetus enclosed in the womb of a mummy of a pregnant woman, which we found in a cave two leagues from Tarma. This is the lithograph from 1842. And this, this was found in the womb yep. of a mummy of a woman, the womb of a, a woman who was then mummified. Incredible. Incredible. That's from 1842. And what's interesting, there are people today who insist, oh, it's all cradle headboarded. Don't watch that L.A. Marzulli. He's out of his mind. You know, don't pay any attention to the man behind the curtain. And yet these same critics never go there. They've never been to Paracas. They've never looked at the skulls. They've never handled them. And in fact, they're not even qualified to talk about them because their area of expertise is in a completely different field. I am not qualified to talk about them, which is why we have anthropologists and archaeologists and geneticists who are looking at the skulls. But I am certainly qualified to discuss the results of our findings. And that's what we're doing. In the preliminary DNA testing that was done from a sample that Lloyd Pye took out of the country about four years ago, and I've spoken of a geneticist numerous times, we are in the process of trying to get uh, material out to do a full genome workup 
um, on these on these skulls because that's at, at some point that's going to tell us once and for all what we're looking at. But the preliminary mitochondrial DNA point in the direction of our hypothesis, and the hypothesis is these are Nephilim tribes which fled the Levant, fled the Promised Land 3,500 years ago. Listen to what the geneticist says. Whatever the, I'm reading this on my other monitor, that's why I'm, I'm turning my head. Whatever the sample label 3A has come from, it had mitochondrial DNA with mutations unknown in any human primate or animal so far. The data is very sketchy, and a lot of sequencing still needs to be done to recover the complete mitochondrial DNA sequence. But a few fragments I was able to sequence from the sample indicate that if these mutations will hold, we are dealing with a new human-like creature, very distant from Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, or uh, uh, Denisovans. I am not sure it will even fit into a known evolutionary tree. Now, that's right out of a geneticist's mouth. That's a direct quote. Um, in an email which he sent myself and Brian Forrester, Brian posted it on his Facebook page. It caused a, it went, it went viral within 48 hours. It was posted on numerous sites. Oh my gosh, how could you guys do this? This is bad archaeology. Well, no one looked at the evidence. Everyone's attacking Brian. Yeah. And all Brian did was just, you know, we, Brian didn't bring out the samples. Lloyd Pye did. And Lloyd Pye is deceased. He died in 2013. You know, the geneticist contacted Brian because that was that was the trail. That's the only place he could go to, because he knew that where the samples came from. And Brian is the assistant curator at the uh, Paracas Museum in in Paracas, uh, Peru. And you would think that archaeologists and anthropologists would be running to this site to get samples from skeletons and skulls like this, but no one's doing it except for us. I want to show you something. With with this, we call this the baby skull. This came from a a site um, uh, in uh, a place called Chongos. Chongos is about a 20, 30 minute drive uh, from the Paracas area, and we believe that the Paracas people were buried, entombed in this in this huge complex area. It's, it's called Chongos. When we unwrapped the baby skull, this is what we saw. Incredible, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And you will notice the strawberry blonde hair. Look at the enormity of the eye sockets. And you know, we need to get more people weighing in and look at this and, and telling us what we're what we're seeing when we hopefully when we get permission, we'll be able to go. This is a cast of the skull. We'll be able to go and get and get DNA evidence from from this particular skull here and then test that. And once we test it. And depending on what we find, no matter what we find, we will make that public to the people. If it if it comes, if it, if the evidence comes up to what we think it's going to do, and it and it holds to what the geneticist is saying that it is not Neanderthal, Denisovans, or Homo Homo, homo sapiens, um, in in that respect, then it, this is something huge. And guess what? It it tracks back and validates our theory, our hypothesis that there was an outside agency that's manipulating the genome. And this is precisely what we see in the Genesis account. Therefore, the hypothesis that we have, if it is true, will validate the biblical narrative. And this, Kevin, is why I'm on the trail. Yeah. And, um, I, I mean, when you look at some of the, uh, um, well, giant artifacts that you've uh, discovered as well, you know, for example, I think there was, a, there was a huge hammer or something, wasn't there, that you found? Yeah, let me show you that. Um, Bruce Fenton is a, I've never met Bruce, but he's a friend of mine. Um, and, he, and he lives in Ecuador, at least right now. And um, there's a site in Ecuador. Bear with me while I, I page through and, and try to find this little guy here. Um, and what, what we found in Ecuador was, was just, well, what, what Bruce found was absolutely stunning. And what's incredible about this is, um, and I'm having trouble as usual, there's a site that is in Ecuador, and it's in a very remote area. Uh, it's about, oh, 12 to 13,000 feet above sea level. And in this area are artifacts. And he contacted me. Uh, with these artifacts and said, you know, L.A., you've got to look at this. This is this is astounding, and we're not sure, you know, what what it is we're 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 looking at here. Um, but he he gave me 
several pictures, and this is much easier if I just go to the table of contents here. Just give me a second. So Bruce allowed me to use this photograph. Interesting, isn't it? That's a huge hammerhead. And a normal man can't wield this. But we, we, we keep finding, Kevin, artifacts in the Americas, you know, North, Central, and South America, that just a normal, you know, six-foot human being cannot wield. It's, it just isn't going to work. And this, once again, ties back and begins to validate that there's that the history that we've been told isn't, isn't the real history. There's another history that's been deliberately, in, in my opinion, obfuscated um, from the general public. And, you know, we have been dumbed down and we have not been told the truth as to our origins. And that's why we're on the trail of a Nephilim. Absolutely. And I'm so glad that someone like yourself has taken up the work uh, of Lloyd Pye as well. I mean, that's, uh, that's so important because he, he got very close, didn't he? Yeah, Lloyd. Lloyd was a great researcher. Yeah, I got I got to interview him a couple of times, and uh, he was he was a real nice guy, and uh, it was a shock to the community when when he passed away so sudden. Um, well, again, you know, you've got the evidence there of 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 these huge, you know, you know, artifacts. But when you think about it as well, you know, where did you know the likes of Stonehenge come from, the pyramids, all the you know, all the places in Peru and everything else? I mean, there's no uh, scientific explanations for these, is there? Well, no, there isn't. And what we see is that these um, these entities, whoever they are. They're working in stone and they're doing, I'm trying to find the Solistani um, towers for you. And, and when we looked at what we found in Solistani, I mean, it was, it was absolutely astonishing. How do you make this? How do you, how do you make this? This is the Solistani tower. It's just incredible. And I, I bet you couldn't even put a, you know, put a bit of paper through there. Oh, you can't. And what's interesting is um, the Solistani, the Solistani tower is, is circular, like this water bottle. But unlike this water bottle, which is plastic, this is this is basalt, and it's narrower on the bottom than it is at the top, which means that the radius, as the builders are creating this circular structure, the radius is changing every centimeter as it goes up. I mean, and this was done thousands of years ago with copper chisels. I don't think so, and 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 the quarry is miles away from the site. And the site is about 12,000 feet above sea level. And there's no way that you can take a copper chisel and, and shape basalt like this. Or you go to Sak um, and, and, and you look at the artifacts, you look at the wall in Sak absolutely huge. And I don't have the book in front of me, I'm a trail volume one, but, but we've got a centerfold in that book, which shows um, it's, an, it's an oversized book, just like I'm a trail volume two is this is eight and a half by 11 it's it's full you know full color photos and it, it's all right there and and sock save them on um we're looking at megalithic stones which are upwards of 120 tons quarried from 40 to 50 miles away and brought to the site somehow now the horse was not in in the new world until well in the new world pre-columbian it just didn't wasn't there um, so with that in mind, how does one move megalithic stones like this weighing 120 tons from 40 to 50 miles away, 2,000 feet below the site? The site, let's say, is at 13,000 feet and the quarry is at about 11,000 feet. So how is that done? And archaeologists, if they are intellectually honest, they don't have a clue. They don't have any idea. But that's only the first problem. The second problem is basalt is softer than andesite stone. And the, and the stones in Sacsayhuaman are andesite. And andesite is about seven on the Mohs hardness scale, which becomes even more absurd that you can't take a, a copper chisel and, and go tink, 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 and, and somehow shape this stuff. And it's even more perplexing. How do you get... How do you get a, a stone that, that you, you, you lay down and then bring in another stone, let's say 40 tons, and put that on top of this stone? 
and do so with polygonal shaped lines. In other words, there were there are no there were no square right angles. Every I think I hold on. I just remembered something. Uh, rats. I thought I had it right behind me, but I don't. Okay. In in Sacsayhuaman, these stones, these megalithic stones, the angles are like this. You know, they're they're not square. They're they're not nice. They're nice right not not little right angles like this. Yes. Okay. They're bizarre. They're more like this. We'll see a stone. Let me just draw it. Something like this. These are the angles that we'll see. And then above the stone, another stone is cut, and, and it drops down into this stone, and all these angles that we see here are matched perfectly. How is that done? I mean, how is that done? You know, what they, they took the stone on and off and on and off. I mean, if we had cranes today and diamond saws and lasers, which we do, you'd be hard-pressed to duplicate Sacsayhuaman. It would be millions of dollars. And yet this goes back in antiquity, and archaeologists kind of shrug their shoulders, and they give you, well, you know, the, the techniques that they had were somehow lost to us. Baloney. We are, I, I call this architecture in Sacsayhuaman, in the Great Circle Mound in Ohio, um, in, in the vestiges that we see in places like Corral, which is about three or four hours north of Lima, in Teotihuacan in Mexico, the Great Pyramid, Stonehenge, all these places, I have come to call it Nephilim architecture. This is fallen angel technology. It's Nephilim architecture. And guess what? The other side of the aisle, with all due respect, the ancient alien theorists say basically the same thing. They go, well, ancient aliens came and built this. And in the classic sense, they're right, because fallen angels are not from the planet Earth. So they are extraterrestrials. But they're not from the Pleiades or Zeta Reticuli or wherever. They're not. They're interdimensional beings, and they come here with the secrets of heaven. The book of Enoch even tells us this, that when the angels came, they traded the secrets of heaven. They wowed mankind. I believe that they have they set up a global system, a global system which was, and this is the book I'm working on, which was actually um, fully operational in the days of Moses. By the time Moses comes on the scene, we see in Egypt, that the magicians in Egypt are able to duplicate Moses' feats, the first three. When, when Moses throws his, his staff down, it becomes a serpent. The Egyptians just laugh at that, and their, uh, their uh, magicians, right, put their staffs, and they throw them down, and their staffs become snakes. The only deal is Moses' uh, snake eats, eats the Egyptians, and that, that's kind of bizarre. But in other words, there's, a, there's an occult paradigm. There's knowledge that's coming down. Where do, where, where do a group of people, let's say, in, in Central America, in Central America, um, suddenly decide to create the Chichen Itza complex, which is this, this pyramid with these steps that come down like this. Yes. And at the base, there's the head of a serpent. And at the winter and summer solstices, the, the, the serpent undulates and comes down. You see the, the undulating serpent come down the steps. And of course, the head is there at the bottom of the steps like this with its mouth open. So the serpent undulates and comes down the steps of, the, of Chichen Itza. Where did they learn to do this? And why the serpent? Why is it always the serpent? And, and New Ages are always telling us that the serpent denotes wisdom. And I said, yeah, the serpent denotes wisdom. But guess where that wisdom is from? It's from the fallen cherub. And he will dispense wisdom. He will give you wisdom. He will do that. He'll give you stuff. But it always comes with a price. And that's what um, you know, I'll, be, I'll be talking about um, in, in excess, hopefully, uh, in, in the up and coming book. Okay. Um, I, I mean, your books are fascinating, and, and, and we've just been, been plugging sure. them as the show's um, been going here. We've just been putting them on the screen. Um, I mean, obviously, there's there's uh, uh, people like David Icke who would say that um, you know that there's a controlling system out there, and you know that there's this alien uh, sort of lizard sort of connection as well. I mean, have have you ever considered his work or what he has to say? I have read David Icke's uh, book, one of the books. I forget the, the title of it. It's down in my library. 
Um, I read it. I found it incredibly interesting. I agree with much of what he says. I think he gets it. Um, but where where he and I part is if he slams Christianity. He doesn't understand who Yeshua was. He looks at Christianity and equates it with, let's say, the papal system or the Crusades or the nonsense that you see on TV. You know, give me your thousand dollar and I will, you know, and you will richly be blessed. You know, this this kind of nonsense that we see it has nothing to do with the experience that happened two thousand years ago, and that that happens to a person today when they come to Yeshua, when they when they come to Jesus. Um, and it, it, I accepted thirty four years ago in the privacy of my own home. I was sitting in a chair and I just I just said a little prayer. I said, "If you're real, come into my life." And guess what? Everything changed. Um, and I had been a follower of, of a guru before that. My third eye had been open. I, I tasted uh, divine nectar, heard divine music, all this stuff. And it's that's all real. But that's the occult paradigm. It never deals all that stuff, all the 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 um, uh, the, the vision quests, the the my third eye being open, the meditation, all that stuff, all those experiences are true and real. Okay, but they never deal with the essential issue of mankind. And that central issue is that we are fallen, we are broken. Everybody that's ever lived, everybody living now. Don't believe me? Just look at look at what happened in France last week. Come on, look at ISIL carving away a, a, a path of destruction, murder and mayhem through the Middle East. Look at the insanity, um, the global insanity of of the of the of sex slaves, the sex trade, which is happening in your country. You know, this this pedophile ring. I mean, hello, we've known about it for, for decades. Nothing new. The Luciferians are all part of this stuff. And, and that's where Ike and I agree. There's a Luciferian agenda. There's a dark secret society which rules the planet. I get that. I understand that. Um, we haven't had a real president here in America, in my opinion, since JFK was shot in Dallas. And that was an assassination. And isn't it interesting? He fired Alan Dulles, and Dulles uh, is on the Warren Commission. Are, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And then they blow away his brother several years later. You know, the lone gunman nonsense. It's, uh, it's just unbelievable. Oh, no. and yet the yes. American people are asleep at the wheel. And uh, let me just say one more thing. The whole gas price thing should, should be a real indicator of what a, what a bunch of nonsense this whole thing is and how it's a shell game and how it's all manipulated. There is no oil shortage. There's no gas shortage. There's only what the powers that be manipulate the price. And the only reason why it's down under $50 a barrel is because they are trying to punish Russia. And the reason why they're punishing Russia is Russia is the second largest exporter of oil on the planet. And, and Russia is attempting to move away the BRICS nation, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa are attempting to move away from the petrodollar, which has been the default currency on the globe since the end of World War II. That is what's going on here. That's why the prices of oil are down. That's what's going on. And I, and I completely agree with you in, in, in most respects there as well. But do you, I mean, uh, uh, this whole thing of, um, you know, uh, uh, let's just go back to then the idea that there may be multiple races coming to this planet. You know, they can't all be bad. Well, there's a, a very interesting scripture, and it says that at some point, the Most High God, the real one, will roll up the universe like a scroll. There are theorists, um, String theory, for instance, which I don't pretend to really understand, okay? But when, when we look at string theory, the idea of other dimensions coinciding with us at the same time. Jacques Vallée, the, one of the fathers of ufology, has stated that the phenomena, the UFO phenomena, seems to point to um, the demon... Uh, how did, how, let me, give me a second... It, it points back to what we read about um, in ancient literature about demons manifesting. And he believes, as I do, that these entities are, in fact, not interplanetary, but they are uh, interdimensional. If we are living in a holographic universe, and uh, there's, there's people that are beginning to believe that somehow 
this, where we are, is like a holodeck, a very complex one, but that's nonetheless, right. a holodeck. And if that's the case, then there might not be anything else but us. And I realize uh, people on the other side of the aisle insist that we are being visited. Well, I agree. We are being visited. But Jacques Vallée believes, as I do, that these are interdimensional, not extraterrestrial. And I spoke with a uh, abductee, a very well-known abductee over the weekend. Um, and this man was abducted. And what he underwent changed his life radically. He's a very burdened man. Um, and this is years ago now. He's lived with this for, for 30 years. Very burdened. You know, you, he's got the weight of the world on his shoulders. And I prayed for this man. And I, I prayed to break, break the burden from him. But he looked at me and he said, L.A., these entities are evil. There's just no way around it. That's his takeaway. Uh, Dr. David Jacobs won't use the word evil, but he says that he is now in despair because of who these entities are. He's in despair. He doesn't think it, it's a happy ending. And that's a man that's been studying this for almost 40 years or perhaps longer than 40 years. Well, you know, I wonder if some of these races have got our best intent at heart because, you know, looking at the likes of people like Dolores Cannon, a regressionist who's passed away now, um, you know, when she would regress people, they would uh, talk about that uh, their abductions were due to them having a past life on some other planet elsewhere or somewhere else where their family, in a sense, was, you know, coming just to check on them, uh, where, you know, that they, they, they remembered the soul connection they had because the veil with these beings was a lot less than the veil on, on this planet that we have. Our remembrance of our connection with source is, is, is you know, not really there sometimes. It takes a, a lifetime to build that back up. But for these beings, their, their veil is less, and they remember who they are, why they chose to come here, and that, you know, this is a very special planet, and, and they're just helping with our ascension. That's just the opposite camp. Well, it is, and, and, and it's eventually we're going to find out who's right and who's wrong. I mean, eventually we, we will know. Um, it may take a few years, um, but we'll see. We, look, I, I'm, I'm a frank supernaturalist. I believe in the supernatural. I believe the supernatural is, is manifesting in ways that we've never seen it. The Black Eyed Kids, which, by the way, there were some sightings um, in, in, your, in your neck of the woods fairly recently, and it made the press over there. Um, these are entities which are, are, are terrifying. And uh, we, in our Watchers series, uh, Watchers 5, uh, Let, Let Me In, discusses these, these black-eyed children who were being seen uh, all, all over America. And I don't mean by the thousands, but we've got accounts from multiple witnesses. And then you had some witnesses in, in, in your country. So, you know, the, this phenomenon is real. And um, I believe that these entities are interdimensional and they tie back into the biblical narrative. They're not good guys. Okay, okay. Uh, I, mean, I mean, your work's just fascinating. It really is. And it's, it, Thank you. It, it speaks a lot of truth to me. Um, yeah, I, 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 I mean, wh what would be the most important message of your work, would you say? Well, I think the, the over, overriding message points back to the biblical narrative. Um, that we're in a culture war here. There are those who look at Christianity and they think they understand what it is, but, but they really don't have a clue. They equate Christianity with buildings and popes and everything I mentioned earlier, stained glass windows and candles and monks with funny haircuts and robes and incense dentures and confessionals, and, and, and that has nothing to do with anything. That's not what Christianity is. And Christianity, and this is what, what I'm so involved in, my work points back to the veracity of the biblical narrative, starting with the Nephilim. And my book, The Cosmic Chess Match, tells us that we are actually in a cosmic war. And that's what the Bible tells us. And it, it tells us in, through the prophetic thread of the Bible, um, the way of redemption, how, how we can have eternal life, not some false vampire nonsense, but how we can have real eternal life by believing in the Son who was sent 2,000 years ago, Yeshua, Jesus, just by believing. That's it. We can't work our way in. We can't do good works to get there. We just believe on him who was sent and, and, and confess our little nasties, all the junk that we do. Human beings are garbage dumps. Come on. 
if we're really honest about ourselves, you know, we get mad, we lie, we swear, we curse, right? We hate. We all do it. That's the stuff I'm talking about. We're all broken. We, some of us carry wounds from our childhood, and, and they've ne we've never been able to heal ourselves from those wounds. You know, I know one woman who was molested as a, as a little girl and carried through her whole life. It ruined her life completely. It ruined her marriage. It ruined the relationship with her two sons. I mean, I've seen all this. I've seen it right, right, you know, up close and personal in people that I've counseled, you know. And human beings, as my first mentor, Wayne Kendall, would say, are garbage dumps. Yeshua came to take all that. But and it, he can take it all. And but, that, that's, that's the miracle of being born again. Uh, absolutely. And, and, and I totally respect uh, any religion, every religion. And I've, I've got a lot of Christian friends as well. And we always have these debates as well. And we, we, you know, we're as good, good as gold when we do. But I always say, well, what if a soul has chosen to incarnate into a body uh, to be an abuser and the other souls chosen to be the victim so that they can grow in some way that we don't understand. When the moment you cross that bridge, um, then you're, you're, you're into the camp that, well, I guess all the people that died in the Holocaust chose that. And that's, that's that's insanity in my opinion well that's if, if the soul carries on forever i mean you're not you're only destroying the body in a sense yeah but but what we're looking at then really there is no good or evil there's no ultimate right or wrong and well, that. that's true <laughs> yeah and and that that just that makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up because if we really embrace that and follow it to its its logical conclusion there is no right and wrong then i guess you know um Pearl, the guy who was beheaded by, by the by one of the terrorists over in Afghanistan, um, you know, I guess he he decided to do that. So there really is no ultimate right or wrong. See, that's crazy. That that to me, my way of thinking, that's that's absolute insanity. Unless because it's the unless it's the way that, that souls progress in some in that's some. That's not sense. how. But see, you see, here we go again. Souls progressing, and that's that gets into the whole Eastern mystical thing. The, the biblical narrative tells us that we're born once and then the judgment, which goes against everything that reincarnation states. See, reincarnation tells us that somehow we're, we come back and we keep coming back till we get it right. And that's, that's like a works trip. Well, how the heck? Show me one person here. Just one person out of seven billion who has it right. And there's no one. No one's got it well, right. Well, when you, you know, uh, no one's perfect. At, mm, true. When you look at other people, uh, some some of the gurus out there, like for example, I mentioned Eckhart Tolle. He does come from a very different space in a sense. So, who's to say there's not gurus down here now, trying to help in their own way? Every guru I have ever been with, and I was with several, um, turned out later on to be total frauds complete and utter frauds and i know where they draw their power from they they there's a liaison just like the shaman just like the guru they're all going to the same place and they're acquiring um this knowledge and certain power and it's demonically infused i mean i spent the last 34 years researching this and writing books about it kevin if you shoot me your address i want to send you a book the cosmic chess match i think you'll find it yeah. really really interesting Definitely, yes, ab absolutely, no, absolutely, no. No, I'm just trying to uh, just to play devil's advocate a little bit, just to see the opposite, because there is an opposite camp there. But you know, your work is still coming from the same place in some, in a lot of sense. I've got to say that it is. And um, well, okay then. One last question: What is the end game? Do you think in all this? The end game is to make mankind into the image of the fallen one. Remember I said it very early on, Genesis 3, your seed will be at enmity with the seed of the woman. There's a seed war going on. And that seed war, in my opinion, we see evidence of it through history. We see evidence of it. And the end game will be there's a, a biblical prophecy in the book of Revelation, which talks about the mark of the beast. And it says that in the latter days, basically, when all this stuff comes down, that you won't be able to buy, sell, or trade without this mark. And we believe that this mark is actually a DNA upgrade. When they show up, and they will show up at some point, when E.T. shows up in mile-wide craft, that's the paradigm shift that everyone's waiting for and looking for. But it's a false paradigm shift. And it will, it will cause a shift. 
and they will come with gifts. And I'm saying this a priori before the event. They'll come with free energy, which will revolutionize the world. And they will say that we created all life on this planet. We genetically manipulated early man. Uh, we're back to give mankind a DNA upgrade. And here it is. You take this little implant, and it will change your DNA. And the problem is the biblical narrative tells us that this is the mark of the beast. And I've written about this extensively in the Cosmic Chess Match. And that's why I want to send you that book, because I think you'll find it extremely interesting. The end game is the cosmic war ends when Yeshua, Jesus, does come back, and he comes back to planet Earth. And what, what people don't understand, that what's, what's about to happen to the planet is similar to the days of Noah. The planet is about to be totally enslaved, and the technology is in place to do it. And right now it's benevolent. But at some point, it will switch, and it will enslave everyone. And that's what that the biblical prophet, prophetic texts warn us of this. They tell us of it. Just think about it. How will you be able to buy, sell, or trade without that mark? You don't take the mark, you can't buy, sell, and trade. Your family goes hungry. That, my friend, is enslavement. And that's where it's headed. How, uh, how can people get hold of your, your books and your DVDs? www.spiraloflife.com net. Oh, I'm sorry. Wow, that's that's um, that's the old website. LAMarzuli.net. www.lamarzuli.net. LAMarzuli.net. And um, we've got all sorts of products up there. Um, look, when you guys buy books and DVDs, it helps me stay in the field and do what we do. So that's uh, that's it's there. There's tons of information, um, and you can avail yourself of the products and um, look at the on um, the trail of a Nephilim which we talked about quite a lot today. I just want to, you know, it's, it's an oversized book, eight and a half by 11, uh, glossy paper. The paper stock is great. It's got great photographs, stuff like this in it. Yeah, it's, it's a fantastic book. I like the size of it as well, and it's, all, it's, 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 it's high gloss. It's a lovely book. So I totally would recommend to, uh, to get that. We're going to put links on everything as well. Uh, well, L.A. Mazzuli, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Kevin. Really appreciate it. Love to come back on soon. Well, we've come to an end on tonight's show. Don't forget that you can listen and watch all our past interviews on the More Show's official YouTube channel. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new daily shows. You may